famine is at Somalia's door. Nearly 8 million people are going hungry because of severe drought, high food prices and political instability. Is there time to prevent a crisis? And what's needed to break Somalia's cycle of aid dependency? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Parts of southern and central Somalia will likely be in famine by the end of the year. That's the warning from the UN's humanitarian chief, who is calling for urgent international aid to avoid a catastrophe. Martin Griffiths, who's in Somalia, says he's been shocked to the core by the suffering and says it's only going to get worse. Extreme drought caused by four failed rainy seasons has displaced millions of Somalis. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made staples such as grains and cooking oil unaffordable. And political instability has hampered humanitarian efforts. The armed group Al-Shabaab frequently attacks relief convoys. The UN has received just two-thirds of the $1.5 billion it needs to provide immediate assistance. We want the world to observe, to listen and to contribute. And many, many governments have. The United States government recently very generously uh, gave money to the humanitarian response program. We need more. And we're going to need more through next year. Life saving, which is the core of the humanitarian business, is what we have to do today in Somalia. No question about that. We need to save lives, lives which are at great risk. But, or and, we need to invest in alternative livelihoods. So many of the pastoralist families, generations of living off their livestock, have no more animals. They have lost their livestock, sold or died from the drought. And the likelihood of further droughts will mean that they won't be able to pursue that way of life that they have had for generations. So what we're seeing threatened in the Horn of Africa, as well as elsewhere, but particularly here in the Horn, is a way of life is under threat. And that means we need to invest in people for an alternative. I went to a site for internally displaced people in Baidoa. People have been there for nine years, nine years that they have been displaced, and we have still not been able to give them alternative ways to live and to live independently of humanitarian aid. It's a massive requirement for international attention. Well, for decades, Somalia has struggled with civil war, political instability and famine. In 1991, warlords ousted President Saad Bar and then turned on each other. Attempts at peace saw several interim civilian governments between 1991 and 2000. Al-Shabaab has been fighting government forces and African Union peacekeepers for control of the country. The armed group still operates in southern and central Somalia. And now, in the midst of the driest conditions in 40 years, the UN estimates 7.8 million people need humanitarian assistance. OK, let's bring in our guests. And in Mogadishu is Afyare Elmi, Executive Director of the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies. That's a think tank in Somalia. Joining us from Darfur in Sudan is Michael Dunford, the World Food Programme's Regional Director for Eastern Africa. And in Bristol in the UK is Nassar Majid, a research associate at the London School of Economics and co-author of Famine in Somalia, Competing Imperatives, Collective Failures. Welcome to all of you. Afiari, if I could start with you, because it's in parts of southern and central Somalia where, where this threat of famine is, seems to be looming the largest. What, what are you seeing and, and hearing happening in these areas? Um, well, I just wanted to add my voice to that of the uh, humanitarian uh, uh, coordinator. And by the way, this is really, uh, this was coming for quite some time. Uh, the world community has been uh, warning, and also the Somali government, for the past three months that it existed, it made one of its first few decisions to raise the awareness of this looming problem. So at the moment, uh, that we have to just focus on rescuing as many people as possible, uh, simply because uh, the, 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 at the regional level where it's about to uh, 
or at least the country is about to declare uh, famine. And I think uh, later on, then we can discuss the sustainable ways or the long-term solutions. For now, all the efforts and all the thinking has to uh, focus on saving as many people mm. as possible. So it's an emergency situation. Just, just give us a picture <laughs> of what that looks like on the ground. Well, I mean, there are a combination of factors here that actually uh, is affecting uh, everyday life. There is the, the, the conflict that's going on at the country's side. We have, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the pandemic uh, that has had serious effects. And also uh, the five seasons that uh, rain was actually, uh, at, at least in short supply. So we have a number of uh, factors that have affected the vulnerable communities and the people who are uh, living outside the big cities, mm -hmm. as well as the IDPs and people who are already living under the poverty line. So uh, the, the whole so-called resilience factors that help it are out of the way. We are in a situation, according to the people who are working in the humanitarian sector, where everybody who can do, uh, who can help, should help. And I think here, maybe I should just uh, emphasize the, the role that the, uh, the the Gulf countries and, and other places can can can, can play mm -hmm. uh, because of their geographic proximity and their I mean uh, 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 it's, it's, I mean economic mm. or at least like. Uh, we, we will definitely look in, in further at economies. the international response a little later in the discussion, Michael. Uh, Martin Griffiths, the UN, UN humanitarian chief, said that he was shocked to the core by, by what he saw, but that his concern is what's happening to the people he didn't see, the people he didn't have access to. Do we know the full extent? Do we know the full picture? I think we have a very good sense of the situation today. Uh, but as Martin indicated, access to these populations is extremely challenging because of the insecurity, because of the role that Al-Shabaab plays within Somalia. Um, I was there two weeks ago. I met many of the beneficiaries that uh, you saw on your clip, and it really is heartbreaking seeing people who have been forced to walk from their homes for days. I even met a woman who'd walked for 28 days mm. with her seven children to try and find humanitarian relief. The World Food Programme has scaled up dramatically, but the problem is that despite the warning signs that we had, the funding has been slow to arrive, and only now are we hitting our peak level of operations, and I fear we're going to have to continue to grow that response to meet these needs. Uh, Nizar, you, uh, the, the human, humanitarian chief, the UN humanitarian chief, again, he said Somalia is one step away from famine. When you looked at the last famine in Somalia back in 2011, you found that the UN had called it too late and that the response was therefore too slow. Do you see the same thing happening again? Uh, yeah, I think there's no doubt that you can say the same again. We, in fact, uh, the, myself and three colleagues who did the work on the famine, the research on famine in 2011-12, put an opinion piece in uh, Al Jazeera, actually, in January of this year. So at least for the last six months, if not for more than that time, we've been raising the possibility that there's going to be a famine in Somalia. We can't necessarily say that the famine itself has been called too late because this, uh, there's recently been a technical assessment and they're predicting that the uh, famine may take place in the last quarter of this year. But that, in a way, sometimes we're playing with semantics here. The situation in Somalia is already horrendous and um, a lot of people have died already um, and this has been going on for many months already. Somali communities from around the world for at least the last year in many places have been raising money and sending money to their relatives in different parts of the country. And we also know very much where the most affected people come from because they predominantly come from certain identity groups, certain population groups in southern Somalia that were the, predominantly the victims of famine in 91, 92 and in 2011, 12. And frankly, the humanitarian system is also uh, must take some responsibility for not having 
uh, called for more resources and, and, and looked for more resources earlier. When we raised the issue in January, this was even before the Ukraine crisis, which has clearly taken away uh, from uh, funding possibilities. But the, the, the amounts of money that we're talking about also need to be put into uh, context because they are minuscule in comparison with the amount of money that was raised for in response to the COVID pandemic mm. and for the Ukraine crisis at the moment. So there's not re- it's not really a question of there is a need for more funding, but but in the end, this is also about the political will, both from the Somalia government side as well as from the international community, and that should have been there and acting over six months ago. The question also about Al Shabaab is an interesting one because mm, and again, we'll get onto that raised... in just a moment. Let me just get okay. um, a response from Michael on that point that you raised that humanitarian groups have not called for resources early enough, and these calls should have been made six months ago. Michael, what's your response to that? I'm inclined to disagree. We have been calling and making it absolutely clear that we needed to move far in excess of the beginning of this year. We were talking about the risk of a famine because of the drought well in the middle of last year. We knew this was coming. I agree, however, that the international community has been slow to make the funding available to allow the World Food Programme and others to scale up. In April, we were only feeding 1.7 million. That was purely because of a lack of funding. We are now at 4.5 because fortunately, the US government particularly has come through with the levels of funding required, but, we need another 327 million just to get through to the end of the year. This is a huge population. As a result, it requires huge amounts of funding. And I agree that other donors need to step up. Okay, Afiare, what was your take on this? Do you think, why do you think the response has been so slow? Well, I think there are other international factors. Actually, the Ukraine crisis was one of the main ones that uh, Somalia and other countries in the Horn uh, were actually the, the attention of the international community and the donor community in particular shifted to, to other, other contexts. We had Ethiopian war, we had other uh, uh, major, uh, I mean, political events that were taking place in the continent. So that has overshadowed the, the Somalia uh, Christ. And second, I think the other factor here is that this became a recurring problem where uh, it, it just happens every few months, every few years, I mean, mm. and that uh, there is a, some sort of fatigue from the donor perspective, but that doesn't justify. People are dying now. And in fact, to the credit of the government, one of the first decisions of the president was to name or to appoint uh, uh, some, uh, I mean, an envoy that raises the profile of the issue. And they've been trying their best to the level they can. But again, uh, it, this is the matter of uh, priorities that the donors were just focusing other areas. Absolutely. I mean, and Nizar, that's, that's true, isn't it? A big problem here is donor fatigue. And, you know, these international organizations, they've got to be careful about continuously asking for money, asking for more, 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 when there's lots of other things on the world stage happening. Do you think this now is the wake-up call that the world needs for Somalia, as the Norwegian Refugee Council has said, or do you think people are already awake and simply ignoring it? I don't think people are ignoring it. I mean, the, the F word, the famine word, is always very evocative, and mm. therefore it can help to raise attention and mobilize funds further. The problem with the F word is that it's already late by the time that it's uh, announced. So yes, it may help to alleviate the situation or make it or, or contain the situation to some degree, but that degree is uh, where we already have a catastrophic situation in many parts of the country and where we also struggle to reach people. I think that's the other issue is that yes, re more resources are needed, but we have also, myself and, and, and colleagues, have also pointed out that more could be done with existing resources, uh, where in particular we have difficulty, and we've had difficulty for the last 10 years to reach many areas mm. of Somalia, and we're constrained to working in certain centres. And so that's been, there's been a great stagnation around uh, any kind of access, um, not just humanitarian, developmental as well. And that's going to remain 
the case. And it's something that we, we've raised in 2014, actually, in anticipation of the potential for famine and these kind of disasters that one needs to be talking to groups like Al-Shabaab early on in the crisis. They are, they have, they're a pervasive presence and they have, are very well established uh, and have been so for over 10 years. Michael, in your experience, how does the WFP access these areas that are controlled by groups that are not the government? It's challenging, it really is. There are a number of areas that are besieged where we are forced to fly commodities in that adds dramatically to the costs. What we're finding at the moment is that populations are increasingly moving towards centers where we are even able to access them. And this is why we've seen such a large number, over a million people displaced because of this conflict. The challenges of access are very real in Somalia today. All of us as humanitarian actors are struggling with this, but we are eager to ensure that to the extent possible, we are able to reach the beneficiaries before they need to move. And so issues of access, negotiations with the various parties is key mm. to us being able to do this. Afiare, one of the critical points that allow for a famine to take place, to occur, is the political failure of the leaders. We've got Somalia's new president declaring all-out war on al-Shabaab, particularly after it attacks the popular hotel in Mogadishu. Is that the right approach, given the situation? Is it not better at this stage to be declaring all-out negotiations? Well, I think this is not either or situation. In general, uh, when it comes to government's uh, effort in consolidating its power, I think it will employ uh, both strategies, uh, show force as well as uh, negotiation. And, and, and I think this is the normal. I am on, on record saying and calling for uh, negotiations, but I understand that normally uh, when a, a given state is consolidating its power, it will also use some sort of sort of force. I think that that's just a, a different issue at this stage. Uh, at the moment, I think what President Hassan did was even, be, I mean, before the government was appointed, he appointed uh, a humanitarian uh, envoy that raises the profile of the issue. Mm. Understandably, though, some Somali politicians are concerned that uh, uh, if sometimes, you know, just the, the word F or families use it, it might shift uh, all the development sectors might shift to the relief. And this has been a concern that some politicians have been expressing, at least uh, when I meet them. But overall, I think what we are now facing and the level of understanding at the government level is, uh, is, is fine. But their, their, their capacity is limited, and that's why they are calling for the international community to help. When 7.1 million people are facing uh, 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 some sort of, I mean, hunger, I, I think this is, uh, oh, oh, everything uh, has to focus on uh, saving as many or rescuing as many people as possible. Uh, yes, we have to pay attention to the institution building later on. We have mm. to talk about longer term import infrastructure and all of these things. That will come, uh, the, the, the debate will come uh, at the later stage. At this, at this moment, I think uh, Michael Griffith and others are actually uh, are raising uh, the, the, uh, the flag and saying, let's try to save as many as people as possible. And I, I agree with that. And I really uh, hope that the uh, countries that are close, like the Arab countries, and uh, also will, will play a role. Now the heavy lifting is being done by the Somali diaspora, by mm. the way, uh, who are sending whatever they can. But what is needed is much, much more than that. Uh, are Al-Shabaab, I mean, it controls so much of central and southern Somalia, doesn't it, especially the rural areas. It almost, it has to be a partner in relief efforts. But how interested is it in helping the people that it controls? Because just last week, it attacked a food convoy where it killed 20 people and burned seven truckloads of desperately needed food. Is it at all a reliable partner? 
Well, that's a difficult question for, for me and I think for many people to answer, actually. And really what that raises is the fact that there sh- these discussions should have been, sh- shouldn't the negotiations shouldn't come right at the in the middle of a deep crisis. And these are mm. some, these are issues that should have been planned for kind of months or even years in advance. So it's clearly, and I think Al-Shabaab is not one single entity. So different, uh, there can be different command structures, different autonomy of different branches of the group in different parts of the country. So I think it's not clear how exactly they're organized. And we know that there are negotiations taking place by different sets of actors, whether those are working, to what extent they're working, they may be working in some areas better than in other areas, how much they're joined up and are the humanitarian sector kind of presenting one face. Uh, Maybe that's not even a good strategy. So I think I think there's a lot that we don't know and there's a lot that will be happening kind of under the surface that we won't know about. But but I would kind of I would also say that, you know, these are also the symptoms of acting very late. And actually, these types of negotiations and possibilities should have been explored much earlier. And I don't think they were. Okay, so, Michael, given the situation that we are in, which is the emergency situation, what at this stage can the international community and should the international community be doing? First and foremost, we need funding. Mm. You know, WFP and other agencies can only scale up if we've got the levels of funding required. And as I indicated, WFP alone needs $327 million before the end of the year. But it's not just about the food. It's about all of the other sectors, the nutrition, the health, the wash, the water and sanitation, all happening simultaneously because the children won't simply die because of a lack of food. It's that combination of factors, particularly diseases and illnesses that will increase the mortality rates. So it has to be that collective effort. Um, We have already moved substantially, but as indicated, four failed rainy seasons. The fifth one is likely to fail at the end of this year. We could be in a situation this time next year where there has been no substantial rain and the population in need continues to grow. Is the world ready to allow large numbers to die? I desperately hope not. The only way to avoid that is to allow the UN World Food Programme and others to continue to upscale its operations. Uh, Fiore, are you you hopeful that that will be the response? I mean, as Michael says, we're expecting the next two rains to fail. That sees us into 2023. This is a crisis that's only going to continue and worsen. Well, that is the general prediction at the moment. But, you know, in 2011, uh, the famine uh, response at the time Turkey led it and they did a good job, at least by helping uh, relieve the problem by by combining aid and development. I hope this time the Gulf states might be Saudi Arabia or Qatar or, 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 I mean, uh, uh, others can lead uh, by at least uh, uh, giving the the initial uh, funding aspect of it, but also uh, trying to help the state because we have a state that uh, unless it's helped and unless it is actually able to uh, uh, to, to control, uh, it, it cannot do anything about famine or any other issue. So I think these are the two. Uh, we, we have a long term response, but also at this time, maybe these uh, countries with rich economies might be able to, 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 to provide immediate response while also uh, learning uh, some lessons from the past, which uh, I think Turkey can can be uh, an instructive here. Mm, absolutely. So immediate and long-term help desperately needed there in Somalia. We'll have to leave it uh, there for today, our discussion. Thank you very much to all our guests, Afiare Almi, Michael Dunford and Nissa Majid for joining us today. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, thisaljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.